Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be welcoming you all to BSI's annual Net Zero Week and to kick off this exciting program of events. As the national standards body representing the interests of UK industry on the global stage, BSI is at the forefront of helping accelerate change in the way we tackle our economic, social and environmental challenges. Preventing the devastating impacts of climate change and achieving the target of reaching net zero by 2050 is the greatest challenge of our time. Our international team of experts work in every sector, sharing best practice, shaping standards, finding new ways to measure organisational progress towards net zero to ultimately help us all get to the heart of the issues surrounding our sustainability challenges. It is our mission to actively support you to achieve your sustainability goals, whether you're at the beginning of your sustainability journey or at a point where our support can help you progress to the next steps. Net Zero Week provides a unique platform to showcase the scope of the work being done across key sectors to meet global carbon emission targets. The series of engaging webinars taking place throughout the week will cover a range of key topics from sustainable finance to net zero in the food supply chain. And through these interactive sessions, we really aim to provide you with the expert knowledge and the latest industry updates to help you reduce carbon emissions and to help encourage you to join us in working towards the UK's ambitious net zero targets. To mark the start of this week, we're also very proud to share our net zero barometer report for 2022. And it provides critical insights into how UK businesses are managing the transition to net zero. Now, based on the results from the survey of a thousand UK senior decision makers and sustainability professionals, the report highlights that whilst almost half of the respondents are focused on business growth, only 20% are prioritising reducing carbon emissions. Given that time is of the essence, this highlights the extent of the challenge that we're facing. Now that said, it's not all doom and gloom. And our annual survey also revealed a desire and an optimism actually from participants that the UK would achieve its net zero goal. And nearly three quarters of those surveyed had already set targets to meet net zero. Post COP26, 78% of respondents were more convinced that reaching net zero targets is possible. For further insights into how industry leaders are paving the way for a sustainable future, the BSI Net Zero Barometer Report 2022 is available to access from the link in the Teams chat. Finally, I want to express my thanks to the organisers who've been working tirelessly to ensure the success of this year's Net Zero Week. Thank you to to our inspiring speakers for giving up their time to share their insights with us. And thank you to all of you who have registered to participate in these sessions. It really is only through collaborative action that we can pave the way to a sustainable future. Thank you. I'd like to tell you about a partnership we agreed last year with Bayes, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. It came about because we had a new energy management standard due to launch aimed at small and medium sized organisations to help them reduce energy consumption and therefore reduce carbon emissions. Now, there's a lot that any organisation can do to support their journey to net zero, but reducing energy usage is a key part of it. I asked Bayes if they'd like to partner with us on the launch of this new standard, knowing the standard would match their aims to support SMEs on their journey to reaching net zero. They were really enthusiastic, so I asked them if they'd like to sponsor some copies so that they could be offered for free download. They agreed they'd sponsor 100,000 copies of the standard. We created a special version of the standard and a guide to using it, and both are available for free download from our website. So if you'd like a copy of our phased approach to energy management standard and a free guide, please visit the website. The link is in the chat, but you can just Google BSI 50005 Energy Management. We have a webinar coming soon, so keep an eye out for that and come along and ask our experts any questions you'd like an answer to. Please do share the link with your members, colleagues and friends so they can see how their organisations can benefit from the standard.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Thatcher, Head of Sector for Environment, Social and Governance. And on behalf of BSI, a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar on sustainable finance, more specifically the role that finance can play in reaching net zero. I'm delighted that we're able to bring you contributions from experts who have such direct knowledge of what is happening in this busy space. And whilst this is BSI's second net zero week of webinars, the first being last January, it's only now that we've chosen to delve more deeply into where standards can bring more consistency, clarity and confidence in terms of inter integrating net zero considerations into investment decisions and supporting markets designed to unlock liquidity to fund mitigation, adaptation and adjust transition. Now, I think it's fair to say that a lot has happened in the past 15 months. And by touching upon the highlights now, I hope this helps frame the contributions we're about to hear. Inevitably, we start with COP26, the ambition to keep 1.5 alive and recognition of the complex system of systems that's needed to achieve this. It's perhaps no surprise that along with the commitments to manage emissions, finance and nature were two of the themes of the Glasgow conference. On COP's finance day, Chancellor Rishi Sunak stated that the global financial system would need to be rewired for net zero. This followed his July Mansion House speech, where he announced plans for companies, pension schemes, financial services firms, and their investment products to report on the impact they are having on the climate and environment. He also announced that the Financial Conduct Authority would be creating a new sustainable investment label so that consumers could clearly compare the impacts and sustainability of their investments. At COP26, global leaders from across government, business, civil society and indigenous communities came together to discuss what was needed to ensure voluntary carbon markets were of high integrity. And the final text of the Glasgow Climate Pact gave formal recognition that conserving and restoring nature delivered benefits for climate adaptation and mitigation which was further evidence that the UK government's long established policy ambition in this area was well placed. In terms of BSI and standards of relevance, 2021 saw the UK's continued leadership of ISO sustainable finance programme. ISO 32210 on the principles of sustainable finance is due to publish at the end of this year and is based in part on BSI's PAS 7340, the first of a suite of fast track standards jointly funded by the UK government and the financial sector. Meanwhile, work on the third fast track standard, PAS 7342 on sustainable financial products has yet to start, but was referenced by the Financial Conduct Authority in a discussion paper issued on COP Finance Day on the proposed label that Rishi Sunak promised. UK experts contributed to shaping a series of ISO standards on green bonds and also developed a British standard, BS 8632, on natural capital accounting. BS 8632 provides organizations with a deeper understanding of how their operations impact and depend on assets like geology, soil, water, air, and living organisms. In doing so, the aim, is, aim of the standard, um, which is being submitted into ISO, is that it will drive more responsible decision-making. Finally, a landmark event took place in September last year, led by BSI, working with ISO and its members, membership, and part of the, uh, as part of the UK's hosting of the ISO General Assembly, the London Declaration became a commitment to ensure global standards will continue to support climate action and advance international initiatives to achieve global climate goals. It commits signatories to consider key climate science in every new standard that is created and will also retrospectively consider um, the same requirements for all existing standards as they are revised. Moreover, the London Declaration stipulates it will facilitate the, the involvement of civil society and those most vulnerable to climate change in the development of all international standards. So that brings us back full circle to collaboration and the need to not only rewire the financial system for net zero, but actually the infrastructure that underpins the design of what might be called the real economy standards that businesses apply in an operational day-to-day -day sense. It's incredibly complex and there are multiple moving parts to factor in. But as always, finance is a major accelerator of change and this is where what we are here to explore today. I wanna to close my introduction by again thanking, thanking our four speakers, reminding you that this webinar is being recorded so it will be available after today. Once we've heard from all of our contributors, I'll chair a brief discussion of the points raised and then take questions posted in advance 
and during the session via the chat room function. So there's a slide there just reminding you it's being recorded this webinar. So don't worry if you've actually uh, having to duck out during it, um, but also an opportunity to submit questions live during the webinar via the Q&A function as well. And we'll, we'll, we'll review those during the course of the, uh, the discussion. So I think that's my introduction done. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker, Nick Blythe. It's, and so Nick will uh, talk about his uh, pioneering work uh, leading ISO in, in important areas of, uh, of change. Over to you, Nick. Yes, thank you, David. And uh, I'll be uh, running through a few brief slides just to give a little bit of context, and I'll be fairly quick, but I hope some of these will be of interest to people on the session today. Uh, so as David mentions, my name is Nick Blythe. I've until recently been policy and practice lead at IEMA, the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, and I'm now starting a new role at AHDB as Senior Environment Manager. I also chair the ISO Climate Change Committee, uh, Coordination Committee, as David mentions, and I'm a member of the uh, Race to Zero Expert Peer Review Group. Um, next slide, please. So in, in these short few slides, I want to run through a few overarching um, context points, and then the follow-on speakers will get into more detail. Uh, net zero, it's important to say that there's some very large significant schemes and initiatives underway. Um, it's certainly a concept that's getting rapid development and rapid adoption. And of course, there's going to be some variation in this initial stage. Um, so now many people are now focusing on alignment. So the idea that practice now needs to align and, of course, avoiding greenwash. So the Race to Zero scheme I'll talk about in a minute, very significant. The Science-Based Targets Initiative, people will have heard of. Um, ISO and BSI and other national standards bodies. So ISO, the international organization, BSI is a national standards body and other national standards bodies are developing uh, significant progress on standards and developments in this space. There's offset integrity developments, which you'll hear some more about later uh, from Dan, and climate-related financial disclosure. So I suppose the big thing that many of you will have heard about will be TCFD, Task Force on Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets, um, set up by Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg, um, the FSB. That's been hugely significant in the financial sector in terms of disclosure of what's called transition risk and physical risk and picking up from that, the International Sustainability Standards Board, a more recent development, has a consultation underway now uh, with two uh, particular disclosure standards, general requirements for disclosure of sustainability-related financial information, but also importantly, climate-related disclosures. And those two standards are out for consultation now through to the 29th of July, and they're important developments. Now, encouragingly, lots of standards bodies are coming together and uh, through the work of the committee I chair, the Climate Change Coordination Committee and also the Technical Committee for Sustainable Finance, there's been a lot of ISO representation uh, feeding into those developments by the ISSB. So lots underway, lots going on, and these are some of the main developments you need to be aware of. And a final mention here, Article 6 as an outcome that has made significant progress now, was stalled for a very long time at the COPs, but made good progress at COP26. So uh, for markets and environmental markets to move, that's significant. And also the UN Secretary General has set up a working group specifically on net zero, looking to improve standardization and support the alignment. And these, as I, as I think I've mentioned, encouragingly, all of these are related. All of these are talking to each other. And uh, we obviously hope that there will be good alignment and good progress in the standard space over the next few years. Next slide, please. So uh, Race to Zero, I mentioned. Um, Race to Zero is, is very significant. It's a UN-backed global campaign rallying non-state actors. It's uh, all members are committed to the same overarching goal, which is reaching uh, emissions, reducing emissions swiftly and in line with Paris Agreement and in line with significantly ambitious uh, scenarios. Um, 
the uh, for example the oxford university net zero tracker estimates that up to 90 percent of the global economy has now pledged net zero in some shape or form so this gives you an idea of the scale of commitment that's coming through um, i would say that um, the interesting thing here is that the consultation launched just on friday each year waste to zero is reviewing its criteria and updating its criteria so this is not a wholesale review this is incrementally making sure that the criteria is improved and refined and there's a consultation live now deadline is the 20th of may so if you go on that link at the bottom of the slide or if you just google race to zero criteria consultation you'll be able to see the uh, eight papers for those eight topics on the right hand side of this slide and you'll be able to comment and read and see what's going on in that space around that consultation uh, next slide please david Thank you. So this is an interesting slide. I've just put this in for a bit of context. Um, and, and this is a model developed by Professor Thomas Hale at Oxford University. Uh, it's available to find on the web if you want to just quickly Google um, uh, Tom Hale and put in, look for his open, me open memo on his conveyor belt governance system for net zero. Uh, so the thinking here is that over the last couple of years, possibly longer, we've really been in this developmental phase, the right-hand side of this slide, with voluntary developments like science-based targets, Race to Zero, and other campaigns have been very developmental and formative, and there's this iterative loop. They've been improving. Uh, this is the frontier of best practice, as Tom calls it, on his slide here. And then that's now starting to move across into the real economy, as David phrased it, through standards and through regulations. Um, so, in arguably, on the left-hand side of this slide as well, there's also lots of iterations and loops between standards and regulations. It may not be as simple as this, but it's a really good uh, schematic, this, I think, for talking about what's happening in the net zero space at the moment, and it's starting to mainstream and scale across the economy. Next slide, please. And one more slide, thank you. We're going to talk here about ISO's commitment to the Paris Agreement. Quick word about the International Organization for Standardization. For example, in 2020, there were 5,256 technical meetings, 800 physical meetings held in 43 countries, uh, 4,450 plus virtual meetings. Just to give you an idea of the scale of ISO. So, um, national standards bodies from around the world coming together working through ISO on standardization. Uh, so a huge, a hugely um, broad um, group and, and a hugely broad process in terms of uh, that consensus-based approach to develop standards for businesses and organizations uh, in all parts of the world. Uh, next slide please, thank you. So ISO has already uh, developed on its own website a, a really good mapping process for how the Sustainable Development Goals map across to international standards. You can access this and see this on the ISO webpage. And uh, ISO's uh, particular, next slide please, thank you. Moving on, thank you. Um, SDG 13 is the uh, Sustainable Development Goal for Climate Action. And this slide sets out the large number, well, and this is not everything, but this is indicative of the number of standards that uh, do relate to climate action across all parts of the economy. Um, next slide, please, thank you. So early on, we had mention of the London Declaration, and I was um, happy to be involved with some colleagues, David and other colleagues, in helping uh, some of the early working and thinking that led into the London Declaration. ISO made this uh, declaration uh, in, in the autumn of last year, just ahead of COP26. Uh, BSI were instrumental in taking this forward, and here you have a copy of the declaration signed by the ISO President, the ISO Secretary General, and the Director General of uh, BSI Standards, Scott Stephen. Um, this is a very significant commitment for ISO and is now going to start to mainstream um, uh, climate consideration even, even more, even more uh, considerably into the uh, international standards process. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. 
So here, just an example, you will be able to find this information on the ISO web page. Um, ISO is developing an action plan. This slide talks a little bit about some of the things in place and developing. Uh, so uh, there, there are initiatives now for capacity building, looking at training and workshops uh, across, the, uh, ac across the international communities. Also, the Climate Change Coordination Committee, uh, I'm, that I'm pleased to be chairing, has already developed a guide, Guide 84, for climate change consideration, and they're looking at more materials and possibly workshops as well to uh, develop and spread good practice in that space of how standards writers consider climate change consideration in new standards. And then also with, in conjunction with the UNFCCC, uh, the uh, ISO and BSI are looking at new initiatives, and there's a particular program called the uh, called the Standards Pace to Net Zero, um, which I think has recently changed its name to Mission uh, Vision 2050. So I've probably got the wrong title there now. So you'll hear more about our 2050 world from uh, BSI in that regard. So forgive me, I've got a slightly older slide there. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And finally to say on the ISO webpage, there has recently been added a climate action kit. This is looking to, and, and will continue to build, is looking to share good practice between uh, in national standards bodies around the world and through the ISO platform to look at really assisting standards developers and policymakers in their commitment to reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So there's some interesting case studies there in terms of how standards are already used and starting to be used in this space. And finally, one more slide. So thank you. I wanted to give a quick overview. I hope that gives you a flavor. But for me, the top takeaway messages are that they're, we're still going through a developmental phase around net zero, but I think a lot of the consensus is starting to come together. And I outlined those um, six or seven initiatives at the front end, which are talking to each other, sharing information, and it's uh, looking promising for the next two or three years in terms of embedding uh, net zero into and across international standards. So thank you for now. That's great, Nick, thanks very much. So as, as we said, that was a, an overview, I think, of the, the standard world and some of the, the main drivers. We're now gonna um, hear from Julia Drebolo, um, specifically going into some of the things I was talking about in my intro introduction, really, about the, the importance of labelling for sustainable financial products. So, Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great, David. And uh, thank you, Nick. That was, well, that was a really interesting session. Um, what I will say now is this is going to be the polar opposite for you for the next 10 minutes. The information I will be, I'll be sharing is, is very, very different from what you've gone through. My um, expertise, my involvement in all of this is as someone who works in financial services, who's been very interested in this area, indeed deeply committed to changing the way people invest. So I will give you the practical viewpoint as to what's going on in financial services. My area is the retail side, so funds, investments that are pointed towards individual investors. Sorry, next slide, please. To give you a little bit of background to myself then, I've worked in financial services since 1989. I run a free to use website called Fund Eco Market, which all fund managers pretty much contribute information to. There are a few that don't. It's free to use, so anyone can access it. And it's thanks to the partners shown on the screen here that you're able to do this. So you're able to look at the different things that different funds consider. And it's a big old database. And I, the next few slides I will show you will explain why uh, it's, it's become so complicated. But to give you more context, I, I do specialise in this area, have done for a long time, not only running a free to use database, but also working with companies, so intermediaries, people who are offering portfolios to people. Our data is now starting to be used on the Fidelity platforms, and I work with industry associations. I am technical author of Pemphrey ESG Academy, and I do this because I think it matters. Um, I, the penny dropped for me in 91 when I first heard about this area, and I've been trying to find ways to get these things taken a lot more seriously by the investment community and, and everybody else, regulators and others, really since that time. So it's with that, that context that I am so delighted that BSI is doing the work that they are now and that the government also is recognising the relevance, but also the phenomenal role that financial services can play. So 
coming back to the title of today's event, I mean, the answer really is that, that the, ph the phenomenal impact of the financial services industry mustn't be overlooked. Bring them on board. Let's use markets to help achieve net zero. Because frankly, I don't think we'll manage it without. So if you can come on to the next slide, please, that'd be great. So when I talk about financial markets, again, referencing primarily um, resale fund market, if I take you back to actually a little bit before I started in this area, there were funds called ethical screen funds. And people always thought they were just about things like armaments and tobacco, they, they never were. They were always absolutely about social issues. At the time we were talking about the apartheid regime in South Africa, environmental issues early on, it was more about pollution and, and plastics and that kind of thing that was, it was really the focus then. We then moved on to the environmental side, which is where I came in, then sustainability, clean tech, stewardship, engaging with companies, influencing change, using your power as a shareholder, worrying about climate risk, responsible ownership, what strategies we should have, then sustainable finance and impact investment that are the newer strands. But the important thing here is that this was never designed as a single area. So if you're looking at developing standards or even regulation in this area, what you need to really understand is that these are different funds that were developed at different times until very recently in you, genuinely by deeply caring people who say, Cracky, we've got to do something about this. And also there's money to be made or lost, depending on how we respond. So they were different strategies complementing one another, but not competing. Really, it just grew and grew and grew until Paris, when people started to see it as a massive opportunity and people started to understand net zero. And that's why we've seen the explosion of interest and quite different motivations that have come through. But not all, but certainly some of the funds that we see today. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So with that in mind, and given all the different strategies that exist, and when we do often refer to them just under a single header of something like sustainability or ESG, but actually they're not, they're lots of different strategies. But what they all look at is one or more of the following four areas, so environmental, social, governance, and ethical. And they will apply one or more of the following approaches, avoidance, supporting good companies, or engaging to try and encourage change. And pretty much every one of them, although there are one or two who are very light on this, but mostly, and certainly the good guys have been doing it in real time, will be looking to either focus on investing in solutions and companies that can facilitate and enable change to be made, things like net zero to make it possible to achieve that, or encouraging real companies to transition. So existing companies as we know, clearly are not at net zero yet. There are a million miles off most of them. So investors can play a phenomenally important role in helping that transition. So two real world outcomes we must deliver is those solutions, investments in new solutions and changing what happens at the moment. And in between those sits an area really of capital reallocation, which is largely what the area has been about so far. But it's really a combination of all of these. And something that's really important that people very often forget in this area is these are all investments. The object of the exercise is to make money. To do otherwise is to call it something like philanthropy or charitable donations. So there's always this dynamic of how do we make money and how do we change the way things operate at the same time. So if you look at the number of different ways we can combine this 4321, you'll begin to you'll begin to realize why there is the complexity that we see in the market today. So next slide, please. The way we split this up for people to try and help explain it, and I run entire events just explaining this one diagram, and, and you'll excuse me for having to go through it in about 30 seconds today. But we classify funds into eight different groups. And we plot them against some common client aims that a financial advisor or someone working in this area dealing with retail clients is likely to come across. Some clients will just have a general interest in sustainability. Others will want to change the world. Others will really focus in on, I just want to avoid coal, oil and gas companies. Some will be more worried about social issues, others more values led issues. Some will want to encourage change and, and improvements, that's your stewardship type strategies. And others, let's face it, will focus very, very strongly on issues like animal welfare. So the important thing about this chart is that the different groups of funds that we see in this field map differently against different client aims. Now, this is important because in designing standard, and I'm involved in the 7342 work, which, as David said a moment ago, has just been 
postponed, but I've been I've been loosely involved in it really since before it was even given a number. Um, we've got to understand that different strategies map to different clients, but they can all point to the same outcomes. They can all help to achieve net zero or to achieve higher sustainability standards and ESG standards, as we talked about earlier. So red, amber, green, keep keep that front of mind, different strategies, different, different clients, but they can all help pull in the same direction. So if we can come on to the next slide, please. And to give you an idea of why we are where we are at the moment with people criticising the area for greenwash, etc. What we've seen lately is a massive growth of the funds that I've got on the right hand side here. Now, to make it easy to understand, and it's, it's really oversimplifying it. But if you think of some funds as being kind of dipping their toe in the water, so they're really focused on perhaps mainstream benchmarks, indices, etc. And they're investing in most companies. So those funds, I would say they're dipping a toe in the water for others that cover more of a middle ground where someone's swimming, their head's bobbing up and down and they're still there in the water, but but they're still breathing air, etc. Whereas you've got others that are fully deep dive, if you like scuba divers, they're right in the market and they're really only investing in fantastic companies. OK, there's going to be conversations to be had about some of the things that some companies do. That is the nature of business. However, if you can understand there's different depths, but the important thing here is that they, they're all relevant. Because some of these funds on the right hand side where we can say it's more of a toe in the water, some of them are huge. So if you've got, say, a six, seven, eight, nine, ten billion pound fund that decides to do something small, like move away from a couple of sectors, perhaps coal, perhaps tobacco, that can send a really strong signal to companies and be every bit as important as those funds that are saying, no, we're only investing in solutions because that's sending signals to the market. So the different role, different benefits that different types of strategies can bring. So next slide, please. But when we're talking about those three groups that I've just circled, funds where there's more of a tilt towards sustainability or where it's just ESG, so risk mitigation, plus maybe a few exclusions or maybe just a couple of exclusions. Those funds typically get referred to as being greenwash. And another term I'll use for that is lipstick on a pig. And I really will put that in two groups. There's some strategies that don't concern me because, frankly, they've decided to do something different and innovation happens. That's that's fine. They will probably strengthen over time. So diverse, unclear or naive or early stage strategies are absolutely fine, providing a client knows what they're getting. What's not OK is when a fund obviously says they're doing one thing and they're doing something different. So if people think that they're investing in something that's net zero, um, and they would expect the holdings to be pretty much you know, aligned with, with, with someone who's got strong views on environmental issues and, and wanting to encourage change and invest in solutions companies. And it turns out they're investing in oil companies or big banks that are financing oil. That's where we have trouble. So there's the OK and there's the not OK in terms of greenwash. But what's important really in terms of the real world, the stuff that we care about, the lives we lead, is really how that lands so there's no point saying oh gosh these people are really naughty telling them off for some somehow or another if you can come onto the next slide please why this matters is because it has an impact on the world around us so it's distorting markets it's destroying trust it's slowing progress it's increasing systemic risk that we will have to pay for later one way or another so that's why it cannot be allowed to continue so greenwash is real. It's not always deliberate, but it happens and it has a big effect. So if we can come on to the next slide, please. We had in the introduction David talking about um, the changes that took place last year that were that were massive. And I've been talking to the FCA and others on this for, for some years to help help shape where we go forwards. And some of the important bits that you should be aware of of the FCA's current business plan as it indicates where they're going is taking what they've now been given as a remit from government and helping consumers to choose investments that are right for them, to encourage people to, or investors to positively influence companies. Part of the solution there will be around labeling, part of it will be around taxonomies, part of it will be around technology, lots of different dynamics here. I haven't got time to go into this any further, but we can come back to it in the Q&A if you wish. So if I can come onto the next slide, please. So we know why greenwash is a problem. We know the government 
and in particular FCA is doing a lot about it now and we know where we need to go so none of this should surprise anybody here I doubt it will but we've got to get to a fair profitable swift transition we've got to get to net zero we've got to get to a linear circular sorry from a linear to a circular economy so we've got to make these changes we know what we've got to do so for investors to get on board is obviously absolutely crucial and we've got to find ways of doing that so next slide please so this brings me to my final full proper slide which is really around how can standards help because we know that regulators can do a great deal but actually standards can do a lot too standards can highlight the good strategies the effective strategies they can showcase things they can go beyond what's what a, what a company might be allowed to do or might try and get away with and take you to where they should be aiming and we've got to aim high on this you know future generations demand this of, of us they can help steer and guide and experience providers and intermediaries and clients there's so many people out there who have not committed their careers to understanding this stuff and they just don't get it so they need help and by and in doing so obviously that will help reduce greenwash and reassure clients and get the money flowing as it must so we've got to we've got to use standards we've got to use every toolkit or every tool that we can find to help accelerate net zero and by doing this we've got to obviously focus on increasing support for for effective stewardship stewardship so real activity between investors where they're putting pressure on companies and they know it's working rather than just saying yes we've written out to 1500 companies this year that's nonsense that kind of thing we need to we need to see it working and standards can help shore up that kind of thing and also we've got to ensure capital reallocation we've got to make sure money goes where it's needed because at the moment there's a lot of clients out there who think they're putting their money where it's needed who just aren't or it's in very vanilla companies now those companies have got every right to exist we've got to make sure clients are not misled otherwise the erosion of trust in this sector will will be absolutely terrible and you know leave us in a whole load of trouble so i think standards can help i think they're really important it's why i've been super enthusiastic about all the work bsi has been doing in this area there's a lot of work being done there's a lot still to be done and i look forward to contributing more to it over the next the next year or so as i say i'm involved in the 7342 stuff um uh PAS standard so yeah with final slide please if you could david and that just brings me to my final point which is to say thank you very much for listening i hope you find it useful as i say we've got free information on funds if, if you want to understand it i hope i've given you the context this stuff isn't easy but standards are absolutely part of the solution and with that i will thank you all for listening thank you that's great julian many thanks um, and that point you made about i think erosion of trust really and the, the need to have in high integrity leads me on to our next speaker bsi's own dan palmer who will be talking to us about voluntary carbon market Thanks, David. And um, also, thank you, Julia. I think my slides probably do follow on fairly well from yours, because what I'll be talking about is a practical illustration of where standards can be created with the aim of um, cleaning up a market that's sometimes accused of greenwash and um, really providing confidence that investments are really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so, David, if you could move on to the next slide. So I wanted to introduce an initiative called the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets, um, which is an initiative that was um, um, created in September last year, following on from um, the Task Force for Australian Voluntary Carbon Markets, um, which ran over a couple of years, led by Mark Carney, the UN Climate Finance Ambassador. Um, next slide, please. So the purpose of setting up this new Integrity Council is um, really to um, to try and make a contribution towards um, getting to net zero and limiting global temperature rises and you know the urgency behind that 
is not something that can be understated. Um, if the IPCC, quoting from the IPCC directly, they'd say, any further delay in concerted global action will miss the brief rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. And the science is clear. Every fraction of a degree matters, every ton of carbon matters, and every year matters. So it means that we need to use every tool that's available to us um, to work as hard as we can to reduce and remove greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere. And the voluntary carbon market is one of those tools. Um, now, it's not the only tool, and it's not something that we would, anybody would say should be the only thing we concentrate on, um, but it can make a contribution to accelerate a just transition to 1.5 degrees if it's rooted in high integrity, because there is quite a lot of controversy around some of the carbon credits that are currently traded. So the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets was set up to provide an integrity first approach. Um, next slide, please. So this is an independent governance body that's been established to firstly to set and enforce definitive global threshold standards that will draw on the best science and expertise available so that high quality carbon credits can channel finance towards genuine and additional greenhouse gas reductions and removals that will go beyond what could otherwise be achieved and that will contribute to climate resilient development. That's the brief for the Integrity Council. Next slide, please. So in terms of how the voluntary carbon market could accelerate a just transition, um, the really important point here is that the voluntary carbon market is a complementary tool to reduce and remove emissions over and above what would otherwise be possible and at the same time to channel finance towards climate resilient development. So it's not the primary solution for fighting climate change. Um, you know, we need robust policy, we need rigorous decarbonisation of the corporate sector, they have to come first. But this is one of the tools we can use alongside them. Because we know from the IPCC Working Group 3 report that we won't be able to meet net zero without moving some of the emissions that have already been put into the atmosphere. Um, so we need companies to commit to credible net zero pathways and reduce emissions as quickly as possible. But while they're doing that, investing in high quality carbon credits and investing in emissions reductions projects alongside those efforts to reduce emissions um, will accelerate getting to net zero. Um, so the aim is that it will complement, not replace internal decarbonisation efforts. They'll be able to channel capital from developed to developing country, countries and economies. It would support innovation and the uptake of emerging breakthrough technologies. It would also need to protect and promote nature and biodiversity and deliver sustainable, um, sustainable development co-benefits. Next slide, please. But the reason for coming back to integrity, which I've mentioned repeatedly, um, and which also points to the need for standards, um, and also is the reason BSI has become involved in this, is that to get to um, to get the voluntary carbon market to contribute as efficiently as possible, we need to address factors that undermine confidence and transparency and that open the door to widespread concerns about greenwashing. There are concerns that the quality of some carbon credits that are currently being traded is not high. There are concerns that companies are using um, carbon offsetting as an alternative to reducing emissions rather than as a complementary tool. And so with those concerns in, 
place, and this goes back to um, one of the things Julia was talking about, the need for investments to be profitable, um, those concerns really limit the ability to mobilise finance that would support mitigation and climate resilient development, because that's, you know, channeling finance towards sustainable investments is really, really important, but they really do have to be demonstrably sustainable. Next slide, please. I think this one, um, this one might build this slide, so if you could just put them all up at once. I think, I mean, there are essentially three pillars to the voluntary carbon market. One is the knowing credits are doing what they say, um, because there is, and, and that's really going to be supported by having a global threshold standard for high quality carbon credits. If you could um, um, accelerate the slide transition now, please. Um, the second pillar is about um, having transparency and confidence in prices um, so that high quality credits are traded in a market that's based on rigorous standards and market infrastructure. And the third pillar is about buyers being able to make legitimate claims that use credits based on accepted standards as part of a credible net zero pathway. The Integrity Council is focusing on the first two pillars. Um, but there needs to be strong engagement between the Integrity Council and the whole constellation of other key players, including um, the VCMI, who are, are working on claims of carbon neutrality. Next slide, please. So the um, mandate of the Integrity Council covers three areas. Firstly, establishing a new threshold standard for high quality carbon credits. And this is really a combination of the core carbon principles and an assessment framework that allows you to evaluate whether or not they're being met. And then secondly, there's governance and oversight of how carbon crediting programmes are applying the core carbon principles. And then thirdly, there's this engagement and co-working with the players across the whole ecosystem to try and drive continual improvement of the voluntary carbon market. Next slide, please. So to um, establish these standards, um, we've assembled a, an expert panel of global experts who are hard at work and very hard at work. In fact, they're meeting pretty much um, every day working on the different components. Um, and the expert panel's role is really we've tried to ensure that there are, as far as possible, no conflict of interests in the expert panel so that they can um, concentrate on um, making sure that the principles are integrity led and grounded in the science. Um, and then they are building on the groundwork that's already been done by the task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets that I mentioned earlier. So the core of the standard is these core carbon principles or CCPs, and they're high level principles that are supported by an assessment framework um, that sets out detailed criteria for each principle. Um, so there are two parts. The first part is the quality principles for carbon credits. So that's factors like additionality. So the carbon credit has to be something that wouldn't have um, happened anyway. Permanence, it has to be something that's not going to be readily erased and so forth. Um, and then second part is around integrity principles for carbon crediting programmes, um, which include things around programme governance, robust independent validation and verification and so forth and for a carbon credit to be approved as ccp compliant it will need to meet both the quality principles for the carbon credit and to be issued by a program that has the 
uh, that, that has met the program integrity principles. I will also define in certain attributes of carbon credits that need to be tagged in registries, such as where the carbon project has an additional significant social or environmental co-benefit, and that can be used in trading of the carbon credits. Next slide, please. So just to give you more of a sense of what we're up to, here's a quick overview of our work plan. So our core focus in the first half of the year is developing the um, carbon crediting principles and the assessment framework. And at the moment, we're right in the middle of the consultation phase. Um, so BSI, um, with, as you know, we're the UK national standards body, but we are partners in the Executive Secretariat, providing our standards expertise to the Integrity Council so that they can run the standards creation program um, with appropriate governance and appropriate standards processes. Um, we're looking to go to public consultation in um, end of May and early June, and that will be a full public consultation um, on a global basis. And then we'll digest the comments before we can publish the first version of the carbon credit principles and the assessment framework sometime in quarter three of this year. The next phase then will be applying the carbon crediting principles to assess programs and types of carbon credit, issuing accreditations and piloting an assurance model to um, lead to ongoing oversight and enforcement. Next slide please. So I think probably the really important thing about creating this um, program to have integrity is that for us to achieve it and for it to work well, we really are, do need to work with a very diverse body of expertise and knowledge and people with experience across the whole of the value chain. And that's how we've, it's, essentially built the group of people that are supporting the Integrity Council. So there's an executive board, there's a distinguished advisory group, um, including world leaders from across carbon markets, but also representing expertise in sustainable finance from NGOs as well as the corporate sector, policy influences as well, and of course, important, very closely, in, important to um, very closely consulted involves representatives of local communities and indigenous people that will be affected on the ground on the front line of this. Um, so as I say at BSI, we've taken a role on the Executive Secretary because we think this is a crucial issue for the future and helping carbon credits to emerge in a way that they can be trusted is very important for the future and it's something where standards have a crucial part to play. So I'll be happy to take questions on this later on. Thank you. And as I say, we'll, we'll, just very quickly, we'll be launching public consultation um, in the next couple of months. And there's, um, we'd really welcome people to have a look at the um, carbon credits and principles and the assessment framework and give us feedback. That's great, Dan. Thanks very much. Uh, an example, I think, of as you said already, uh, where BSI is doing some some important standards work uh, outside of its normal uh, habitat of uh, being the UK member of ISO. Uh, an, an opportunity, obviously, to keep in touch with that work, not through maybe the normal U BSI channels, but through that email address that, that Dan provided. So next, I'd like to um, uh, hand the mic over to uh, Helen Edmondson, who will be talking about some important work that are leading on uh, regarding uh, ecosystem service markets. So over to you, Helen. Great, thank you very much, David, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me on your panel. Um, as David said, my name is Helen Edmondson, and I head up the Green Finance team in the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, it's very nice to be going last, actually, on the panel, because I feel like I can touch on several of the issues that the previous panelists have mentioned. Uh, 
with the focus obviously from where I sit on the key role of nature, nature-based solutions. David, I think you said at the beginning there was a really strong focus on natural capital and nature, um, and we saw that prominently at COP26. Uh, so the time is, is definitely nigh. Um, when we think about net zero, there's this wonderful Venn diagram, I think, when we think about climate and the wider environment of activities that we can be putting in place I like to think uh, we're working in a system, not a hierarchy, and it's important that we um, tackle these challenges together. Um, so just as, a, as an intro then, if we move to my first slide, we are going to tackle those challenges. We need both public and private sector at the table. Um, and government definitely recognizes the key role that the private sector and indeed private finance is going to play if we are going to meet our ambitious climate environment goals. Um, we set out as much in our 25 year environment plan, and then government also launched its inaugural green finance strategy in 2019, again, recognising that critical role um, of the financial sector, really driving forward um, and delivering for the climate, um, uh, but also environment. There's lots of studies out there that the sort of eye-watering numbers that are needed if we are going to meet these goals, something around 50 to 60 billion per annum over the tw late 2020s and 2030s to get to net zero. Um, and then alongside that, uh, you saw the Green Finance Institute. They did a report looking at financing for UK nature's recovery that has a sort of central estimate um, at around 56 uh, billion over the next 10 years. So they're not insignificant numbers uh, and we do need to pull in all directions if we are going to meet them. So what, what, how are we doing that? If we move to my next slide. So we had our spending review and our budget last autumn, uh, and in that, specifically on the natural environment, we have set ourselves an ambitious new target to raise at least 500 million in private finance to support nature's recovery every year by 2027 in England, and this will rise uh, to more than 1 billion by 2030. Um, and I do think this is an ambitious target because we are still at those early stages in the development of ecosystem service markets, not just carbon, but thinking about biodiversity, nutrient management, um, thinking about natural capital as really a, a sort of core part of our infrastructure. If we think about greening infrastructure and the role it can play in things like natural flood management, sustainable urban drainage, um, we, we really are at the beginning of the journey. There's some exciting things happening, but how, how do we get it to scale? That's the, the key issue um, over this next decade. Uh, and indeed, we've already set out our ambitions. I mentioned obviously net zero before. We have that in our Climate Change Act. Um, very exciting. We had our Environment Act last autumn and puts on the statutory footing uh, our environment goals. Uh, within that, we also have biodiversity net gain, um, obligation on developers to um, invest in biodiversity plus 10% for any developments. That's really exciting, consulting on that currently. There's also a consultation on the emissions trading scheme and again, the role of negative um, or greenhouse gas removals and natural GGRs, as they're referred to, consult, consulting at, the very, at this very moment. Um, and there's also a Nature Green paper, which is out for consultation, again, exploring what additional mechanisms we could put in place to really get the private sector moving and investing uh, in natural capital and really seeing it as, a, as an asset class as we uh, progress, gallop into this, this next decade with some extremely ambitious targets by 2030. Um, so, Moving on, how are we in DEFRA tackling this uh, rather large challenge? Um, I sort of think about the work that the team is doing and indeed the whole department across four pillars. So first off, when we think about the natural environment, the issue that often comes up is, well, how do we get it to pay? Where, where is that revenue stream? Where is the market? How do I know that if I make this investment, I will get a return? And um, Julia, I think you said it, uh, uh, in, in your remarks that we want the finance to come to the table, it really does need to pay, otherwise it is um, philanthropy, which is good, but we also want the private sector to be able to invest. Um, and so how, how do we give that integrity and that certainty and set up this ecosystem market framework? Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a bit. Second, if you have those revenues, um, how do you package them up and how do you make a pipeline? Um, another challenge that we hear in our engagement on how we support the development of a natural capital asset class is, well, where are the projects? Uh, how can we invest? Um, what, what is the ticket size? Is it large enough? How do we really get this market moving? Um, and we have a whole bunch of different activities that is really trying to do that. So our Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund, how do we bring these different revenue streams together? Um, and we have just finalised our procurement for a big nature impact fund, um, which can provide that initial um, impact investing to start 
pulling this pipeline through so that commercial investors uh, can get more comfortable and can see how those risks are actually uh, materializing in this natural capital space. So we have revenue streams, we can package them up, we're thinking about impact investing to start bringing these through. Um, but again, what, one of the other challenges that we hear is the fact that this is still very new um, across different actors, trying to think in, in a sort of more commercially minded way, in a way where your ENGO community, um, your local government, uh, your all these different practitioners, how are they actually coming together and thinking about those innovations that are needed to get the private sector and the financial sector to come to the table? Um, local capacity, skills, the jobs that are needed, these are all issues that um, come up time and time again in terms of how we are going to accelerate this market development. Um, so again, we are uh, working across government um, on this, um, including with Bayes on their Green Jobs uh, Delivery Group, which we're very excited about. So I guess in the words of the green finance strategy, uh, you have how do you, um, how do you finance green? Um, and those three pillars are exactly how we're hoping to do that in the natural capital space. And then the other element is, well, how do we green the financial system? How do we properly put nature into the decision-making process of, of financial players? And we are working very closely with our colleagues um, in the Treasury on the green taxonomy. And David, you mentioned that in your opening remarks. Um, and Julia, you touched on this as well about the importance of driving out greenwash. And this really is a critical tool to sort of provide the, the certainty around what good looks like. Um, we in DEFRA are also supporting the market-led task force and nature-related financial disclosures. Um, this was uh, first mentioned actually in the green finance strategy back in 2019. We saw the G7 welcome the TNFD uh, and it just launched its beta framework uh, just over a month ago. So again, really excited to see the progress that that is making and then particularly excited that the market has really grasped this with both hands and trying to but a bit more clarity on exactly how we start measuring nature. If you can measure it, you can manage it, I think is the expression that gets used. And that really is uh, critical when it comes to the natural environment. So, moving on. Next slide, please, thank you. So if we're back to this point about the ecosystem market framework, um, and this is why it's very nice actually uh, to come straight after to Dan, integrity, integrity, integrity. This really is key if we are to build this market. Um, sometimes I think people can make um, suggest there's a potential trade-off between environmental integrity and the growth of these markets. I mean, I think it's a false dichotomy to be making because without that financial integrity, you don't have the assurances from the financial sector that this is something they could be investing in. And, and this really is key. It's key across carbon. It's key across all of the natural environments. You know, we are putting in place um, incentives to really support multifunctional land use. Um, and integrity really has to be the backbone of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that it has to be complicated and has to be complex. Um, we, have to, we have to do this in a way that simplifies what good looks like for the suppliers um, of those ecosystem services and the buyers if we're to make sense of it. So we can't let the, the challenges of how we show and prove integrity to get in the way of simplicity um, if we're really going to make this market work. Um, and again, similar to what Dan was just saying, um, transparency and fairness really is key across all of this as well. Um, transparency, critical uh, to address these issues of greenwash in particular, um, and fairness again in terms of who are, who are the benefit, who are the beneficiaries of these different actions. Um, so that, those are the sort of high level principles, I would say, across how we are exploring and developing our thinking around ecosystem service markets. Um, and this really is a partnership, I would say. And we're exploring at the moment the exact role of government and how we're developing this market framework, how we how we get that sweet spot of providing that um, that policy clarity and being clear about what we think good looks like, but enabling enough space that we have flexibility uh, for innovation and for different people to come to the table. Um, exploring and working indeed with the BSI, um, exactly how we support the development of these standards standards um, and make sure that we are working across business, investors, critically landowners and farmers who really understand that natural environment and what's possible. Um, and we're trialing and we're innovating. I mentioned our investment readiness fund before. Some of this can feel quite conceptual. I think it really helps the way we're working with partners directly on the ground to see how these things start playing out. Um, with our environmental land management, we have test and trials in place where again we can start seeing how this, how this actually works on the ground. Um, and translates a, a policy 
into action, which is really important. Um, next slide. So uh, uh, basically the backbone to all of this is standards, uh, which is why presumably I was invited to talk today. Um, how do we find that, that clarity? Again, this sweet spot of um, providing enough um, guidance, enough steers to ensure that we have integrity, we have transparency, um, but again, doing so that there is enough flexibility for different people to come to the table. And, it, and I think now in particular, it's really come to a head. We are working very closely with the Broadway Initiative um, on the financing uh, UK nature. Um, and it comes through loud and clear this point that we need clarity on what the standards framework is. We need clarity about what good looks like. Um, it's a sort of a thousand flowers bloom, I would say, approach at the moment. And I think that's normal um, in these early stages of market development. But the time is nigh to try and provide a few more rules of the game um, to provide those assurances around issues such as um, additionality, permanence, uh, and all of those elements actually that, again, Dan touched on before um, on, on the carbon markets. Um, and what we hear is that it can be a bit confusing. There's lots of different standards in development. Um, but actually, if we can work in partnership to provide more clarity on this, we can really help scale investment uh, into the natural environment, just as we had seen in other markets. Um, and so we're currently thinking through, well, what does that look like? Um, having an overarching set of principles to help inform how people are developing standards around um, these principles, again, on, on additionality and, and permanence, um, working with key standards bodies, such as the BSI. Um, and again, that point I raised before around actually testing this on the ground, seeing how it's all playing out, um, providing that clarity about this sort of this pipeline almost of standards that are being developed, um, how to navigate through that process. Um, so finally, just on my last slide. Thank you. Um, I think just the sort of my um, final remarks really are the fact that this is does require partnership between government, between business, between standards bodies, between the financial sector, um, learning from each other. And again, I think a sort of a takeaway point for me is just this point around the, the sweet spot uh, of providing enough guidelines and enough regulation and, uh, and enough clarity on the standards um, to provide that assurance and that integrity but doing so in a way that still enables that innovation that we really do need if we're going to scale these markets and reach our ambitions for the private sector to support nature's recovery. So thank you. That's great, Helen. Thanks very much. Um, I'm actually going to put my uh, my camera back on again, so if I can ask everyone else to do the same, because then we'll go into this roundtable discussion. Um, it was great, actually, to hear so many uh, of you referring back to uh, other participants. It's almost as if uh, we designed the, the, the order, the running order, so we could do that. Um, but no, actually, it was, it was great. I feel like that what we heard there really sort of... Uh, uh, flowed into each other. That was great. Thank you very much. And, and Helen, you were you were talking at the end there about the importance of of standards, both providing some kind of I suppose rules to the road, but also a, enough flexibility to allow um, innovation. Uh, and, that, and that's very much what we say is a kind of a, the core principles of what we do here at BSI. It's about enabling uh, innovation, but also working towards kind of common languages. And uh, I think we may talk sort of later on about the use of uh, or the application of data, for example, in terms of quantification for things like soil carbon it's you know it's, it's really important to work with consistent terminology um, so we're moving into the the round table discussion which I'll probably do for about 10 minutes then maybe 10 minutes of some questions we've got Helen I think you may have to leave before that so I, I'll, I'll see if I can um, maybe throw one question in we've received but one thing I wanted to do at the beginning of this session is I suppose maybe start with a perhaps a bit of a provocative statement given this is all about the role of uh, or, or looking the present and the future about how um, uh, the general trend uh, towards uh, of sustainable finance. I mean, a stat I read recently was $130 trillion or about 40% of the world's financial assets have been committed by financial institutions to align with the, the, the goals of, of, of Paris. But given uh, the current soaring price of energy, the current cost of living crisis, is there a danger that um, the main criterion going forward uh, in terms of decision making by investors, whether they're institutional or, or private consumer investors, is, do you know what, actually, I just want the biggest bang for my buck here. I'm not actually going to be swayed by what is a more environmental, sustainable outcome. Is there a danger that we're, we're, we're sort of going into sort of uncharted waters in that sense? And, or, or has this moved 
so far beyond being something that was a fad 10, 15, 20 years ago, as Julie was saying, that actually this isn't the future of, of, of investing is ESG in spite of current crises. I don't know who would like to take that question because it was a bit provocative. I'm, I'm happy to jump in to get the ball rolling <laughs> if you want, David, if not. Um, yeah, please, please do, well. please do. Um, so so this, this area, as you say, it has ebbed and flowed for, for some time now, um, for sure. Uh, as someone working with, with financial advisors, with distribution people, et cetera, I've always pushed very hard at them to say, this should not be driven by making money as such, even though it's got to be investments that make money. But making money shouldn't be your core requirement because obviously that takes you to very short term thinking. And actually in order for the long term to work out, we need people to think think differently and think longer term. So yes, I think there is a risk. I think there'll be an element of people who have never agreed with my line of argument on that, who will always just say investments about making money. I, I think I think for sure there's an element there. But I think an awful lot of people, you know, thank goodness, given that now regulations and government and IPCC and everyone are making things crystal clear, I think there's a really big chunk of money out there that will not be going you know after short-term profits so I, I like to think that whilst there'll be both camps I think the majority now that government has jumped in at last because I, I was saying that 15 years ago and obviously financial markets hit and loads of people like I, I was working for a big company at the time that I was the person that did sustainable investment they got rid of me so you know th th that was definitely what happened in 2008 but I don't think we're going to see 2008 again and I think what you're probably saying, I want to obviously pass it on to others as well, is that in the same way that um, in a more generic sense, environmental management, sustainability has mostly in, in, the, in a corporate sense moved from being a niche discipline. And I guess is where maybe Nick's experience at IEMA to being something that is, is increasingly driving the actual uh, strategic um, you know, direction of businesses in terms of okay, maybe not always having a a sustainability director on the board but certainly it's informing those, those big decisions that companies are taking partly for economic reasons in terms of things like um, you know res where, where resources are going to be um, drawn from in future um you, well, i think what you're saying is therefore you know this this particular oil tanker has now sort of uh, turned a certain point now it's not going to go back again nick your 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 take on that i don't know whether you've got a, a share the view that julia said there that we've, we've moved the point of no return in that sense well, well, I think we'd like to think so, wouldn't we, that, that we have reached that point. Um, certainly, it's very mainstream now, David. Um, I think some of those schemes that I mentioned at the front end are indicative of just absolutely enormous commitments that are being made. They're, they're almost mind-boggling to get your head around some of them, you know. So some of the commitments for, say, the, um, the COP Champions Team's Race to Zero um, campaign are enormous and there's about there's there's around about two dozen wider initiatives within that campaign science-based targets the finance sectors commitments asset management so you you just look at those scales of commitments that are being made so you know cynically some people would say does everybody know what they're signing up to with net zero does everybody getting this you know i think increasingly people are understanding what the consensus view is and it's not just about balancing emissions it is about for many businesses it's about making mainstream significant reductions in line with a science-based scenario so that could be 45 percent cut by 2030 um, and of course having alongside that balancing residual emissions through credible schemes the kind of things that dan was talking about um, so yeah there's a there's a real complexity to it but but i think many are understanding that complexity and you know let's hope that everybody knows what these commitments are and uh, the, you know the proof will be in the pudding with, with, with many of this and i think it's really interesting to think where the finance is going to come come from the, the figures that helen talked about were enormous weren't they as well you know just just in that in that in that kind of context so obviously how much of that will come from carbon markets how much of that will come from green finance more specifically through green bonds and that kind of measure, it'd be really interesting to see how that all pans out now. One question um, you made, Helen, um, the observation about the, the green finance strategy from 2019, which I think is maybe 
uh, being revised or reviewed this year. But I, I think within that, I'm not quoting directly, but there was definitely reference to the fact that the, and this came out of the, the 10 point plan as well, uh, about 18 months ago. There's obviously ambition there for uh, within UK government that the UK needs to be the center of, of green sustainable finance, the global center of green sustainable finance. Um, and I think at BSI, we've always felt, and I hope, I hope that's a view shared by UK government, that if UK government wants the ambition to be that the UK is the home of a uh, global centre of UK finance, then maybe the UK should be the global home of, of sustainable finance standardisation, which I also would extend to the work that you're doing there. Um, do, you, do you see there being benefits here as the UK being that sort of global leader in this space? And I think maybe Dan, some similar question to, to what we're doing, BSI is doing within that Integrity Council. Are there, are there, there benefits for UK um, on a global stage to be seen to be pioneering in this space? Uh, well, the short answer is obviously yes. <laughs> um, I think there's a really interesting combination of expertise as well. So yes, it's the financial sector um, and the innovation that comes from that. Um, it's also just the point that you were raising about standards and our expertise actually in that, how we work together um, across different players and how we pull them together and, and implement them critically. We also have a pretty strong regulatory environment that's highly respected. And I'd say across both finance and environment, um, and we also have a really strong ENGO and conservation sector that actually understands how to do these things on the ground. So if we think about green finance, it's important we've got expertise on both of those words, uh, on, on the green and the finance side, and can bring both of them together. Um, and I do think we've got this fantastic melting pot in the UK that does all of that. Um, and I think the other thing, though, that is also really important is if you look across all of the different surveys when they talk about climate and environment, there is a huge consumer demand for these kinds of products and wanting government to you know, take action on these issues as well. So we, you know, we have the political mandate from citizens to want to push forward on this agenda as well. So you've got a, a fantastic array of different um, uh, pressures, incentives and expertise that we can bring together. Okay, thanks. And, and, and Dan, you, I mean, BSI, we always like to sort of claim we're very innovative and, and world leading in terms of standardization. And typically that's working within a regional, European or international standards um, sort of infrastructure. But what we're doing here with the Integrity Council, as you said, is, is, is new for us as well. But it's a great opportunity to bring the, that knowledge and insights maybe back into the ISO um, sort of uh, world as well. I'm not sure if you're, are you on mute there, Dan? Well, that's, certainly one, that's certainly one way things could play out in the, in the end. I mean, the reason for um, us working directly with the Integrity Council, though, is actually, it's the speed with which we want to make things happen in this instance. The Integrity Council um, and the, the Task Force for Australian Voluntary Carbon Markets were up and running. They needed some standardisation expertise. Now BSI is well placed, but it's also about it is also about the UK's um, the UK's global reputation in finance as well, and the ability of the UK to be a credible voice in this discussion. And as Helen was saying, bringing the expertise in a range of different areas. So you know, sort of, I think it's almost like that there's an expectation that this is the sort of thing that the UK should be one of the world leaders in, and for um for bsi i mean one of the one of our partner organizations in the executive secretariat is the green finance institute based in the city of london and um it's a global initiative with you know sort of co-chairs in ecuador and germany and portugal but for it to be happy to have a secretariat that's based in london seems entirely credible for it Nick, you, you've obviously experienced the, through your role as the chair of the ISO Climate Change Coordinating Committee the, the need to, um, in a way, bring together different um, uh, members of, of, of ISO, different uh, national members of ISO from different parts of the world. Do you think the UK has, has a, 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 a well-earned reputation in this area, both of standardisation, but in particular in the, the financial sector as well? Thank you, David. Um, well, I'm, I'm not going to say no, am I? I mean, it's it's obvious, um, but so the way you face that. Um, but there's there's some really good practice. I mean, I think the UK is recognised, and we had a 
we had a presentation to the uh, committee from uh, Chris Stark, the Committee on Climate Change. We invited Chris to talk to a group of international experts through the committee, and, and that was well regarded, all looking at transition scenarios. By the same token, there's some really good practice. So, you know, some hugely significant developments going on around the world. And, and, and some of the African countries that are on that action toolkit that I mentioned in the Caribbean as well. Um, and also some hydrogen developments, interestingly, in Canada and, and places. So, so there's a really good, I think, I think what I would say is there's, um, there's a real diversity of practice that is quite context specific. But there's some core principles that cut across everything as well. So I think that's the really interesting balance through standardization is, is what are looking at those core principles, what we mean by net zero, that understanding of what a net zero transition is, um, as opposed to just balancing. And, and I think that's, and, and it's not going to be the same necessarily in every sector, but there will be some really interesting um, core and, and important core principles across all of this. So. So yeah, there's a good, there's a good, um, it's, it's not straightforward. There's some real complexity, but I think there is some straightforward principles and basics that are really good to standardize and clarify. Yep. Um, you talked about, um, I think at one point, the, the tilt towards sustainability, this idea that, you know, there are, um, I suppose, funds that have ambitions towards being sustainable. And there's this kind of you know, others that maybe haven't got there yet and this sort of peat soft bit in the middle. I don't know. I mean, it's probably a bad analogy to talk about food in this context, but I'm just thinking about, you know, we know that there's a health warning on cigarettes, that they're bad for us. Uh, and thank you, uh, Helen, by the way. I think she's just left us, had to go to a 320. Uh, we know that cigarettes are bad for us. They've got a clear label saying this is, a, this is not good for you. Equally, we know when we pick up some carrots, um, you know, it says one of your five a day, but there's a lot of other food in the supermarket that has neither label. Is it the case from your knowledge of what's happening with the regulation in the UK that, that if something hasn't got a label on it, therefore by definition it would not be sustainable or has it not yet um, been able to demonstrate its sustainability credentials? Where, where, how, how is that, how's that going to work in terms of the consumer being made aware of whether we're talking cigarettes or carrots? Thank you, David. So, yes. Um... Good question, and this is what we're working on. So I'm part of the FCA DLAG, so Disclosure and Labels Advisory Group, where these are exactly the conversations. In fact, one of the meetings on that is going on right now. I'm, I'm missing the first half of it to, to be here, but that, that's kind of the point of a lot of this, that you've just got to put the information out there and make sure that people do at least know what they're getting. So you know if you're having a cigarette, you know it's dangerous. You know if you're eating a carrot, that it's good for you. Um, so I think that that's kind of the first step. Everything that sits in the middle, I, I'm not sure. The, the, what we will land up with is, is different levels, almost certainly, of, of labels for funds. So it won't be a binary yes, no, um, sustainable, not sustainable. Um, it'll be a bit like eating a sandwich, if you like, where you can say, well, okay, the bread's full of carbs, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's going to be other. So they may get a slightly lower down down the rank. Um, sustainability label and then others will be focused more perhaps on on companies that are, are, are absolutely committed to changing the way we lead our lives so there'll be a little bit of a scale thing going on we're expecting um, and then that kind of thing was proposed in the discussion paper uh, put out tail end of last year and the new thinking on it we're, we're, we're literally we're still going through it so it hasn't it's not decided but there will be another paper out on it midway through the year so, so yes, I think I think the important thing is that people know what they're getting, so that we don't destroy trust in the system, which is what we've been seeing recently. And and the ESG plus label that that we use is is really important. And fund managers often don't like it, but when you sit down and talk to a fund manager and say you've got a sustainability tilt, or you're really just doing ESG, which is risk mitigation plus some bits and bobs, they very often think they're doing a whole lot more. And then you show them other funds. And they can kind of realize that, that they're not up there with, with the carrots. <laughs> they're, they're somewhere in that sort of sandwich zone where there's a bit of, bit of good stuff, a bit of bad stuff. So, so I, I would hope we can bring clarity to it um, like, like that, really, um, by, by just making it clear what people are getting. And, and we've got to, as I said in my part in my piece, that when I said the um, sustainability tilted funds, some of those funds now are massive. They're funds that have rebadged. And the media and others have been quite critical of them because they're not doing as much as, if you like, the real sustainable funds, the, 
the guys I've been working with for the last 20, 25, 30 years, which are clearly head and shoulders above most, but that tilted type strategy can bring the critical mass. So a lot of the a lot of the index link funds and stuff that people are very critical of, it, it's nothing like the leading funds, but it's still incredibly helpful. It can help us get to net zero. Okay, the standards need to go up. So standards in small s, if you like. So the quality of them needs to improve over time. But in terms of heading in the right direction, they, they're phenomenally welcome. So they all have a part to play. You know, providing you're talking about big capital and meaningful change, um, we, we've got to be accepting of all these different things and then yeah, move away from the cigarettes, but there'll be some bits that aren't aren't perfect and we should be, we should be accepting that for the time being. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose again, and this is not to put you on the spot by saying yes or no to this, but to keep, carry on with that food retailing analogy, a little bit like the, the, the traffic light system that we're familiar with, which is, yeah. okay, this is lower in salt than that one is, but that one's higher in fat and therefore I've got to just find some kind of middle sort of decision making in terms of whether I, I go with that particular filling or that particular filling and, and that's really what one of your slides I think showed with those those almost different traffic light systems. Yeah so um, I mean that was one of the bits that, that a lot of people had talked about generally wanting the regulators to do. Um, I, we haven't got that far into the conversations yet there's, there's still sort of general structure being worked on but but I, I can see it's a possibility and if you know I, I, I put forward an idea for how that could work in my response to the delay uh, to the um discussion paper that came out till end of last year and you know if uh if the fca doesn't do it i, I figure somebody else would certainly i've spent days thinking through how it could how it could look and, and, I, and i'm pretty sure other people have too but yes i think that kind of thing absolutely is where we need to be getting to and it's about openness transparency collaboration everyone doing what they can do um, and gradually moving themselves forwards but we, we know times of the essence but if we're not welcoming to people and, and accepting of the fact they're not going to be perfect straight away they're not going to get anywhere because they'll just they'll just stay away like, like they did for the pre you know mostly for the previous 20 years one thing i think helen was saying and this is probably the question i wanted to just uh, take from the audience here which was to do with data she was talking about the importance of innovation and the fact that we bring we need to bring you know in a way all stakeholders to the table which is what we do at, at bsi anyway as a convening body you know um one thing i've been made aware of is the the very exciting potential there is for uh, innovation technology data driven uh, digital solutions in terms of things like assessing soil carbon uh, and also the use of use of um, satellite technology earth observation science um, but equally i suppose it's an area that needs to have some kind of uh, standardization some guardrails to make sure that terminology is consistent I'm, I'm not expecting any of you to be maybe experts on satellite technology earth observation but um, any views on that the fact that we need to both encourage this type of technology because it can be used and applied um, in, a, in a practical way but also we need to make sure that maybe just like you were saying uh, Julia about you know bold statements being made about funds that the use of technology has to be supported by by good practice uh, and trust otherwise really we, we're not moving forward on this any any views on the importance of, of standards supporting digital technology in this space i think the good word you said there was was guardrails because this stuff is so early so i i can talk to fund data a little bit i'm hoping yeah. Dan or nick can widen it beyond that um so at the moment all the data providers disagree and everyone thinks that's a really bad thing Whereas I know the funds and I can say, well, they, of course they disagree because they're doing different things. You know, if, if one if one research is looking at, I don't know, governance structures mostly, someone else is looking at environmental standards mostly, of course they're gonna give you different data. So so at the moment to try and, you know, to try and shackle it too much would be very, very damaging and certainly in my area, but you certainly want people being open and talking about what it is they do. So, so guardrails, you know, be, yes, but don't try and pretend it's a fully developed market because it just isn't certainly on my side I'll, I'll hand over to the others so i'll just say something on that david i, I completely agree with julia's point about the um in a, in a different framing with the with the, talking to some colleagues in the race to zero campaign that there's a kind of phrase that gets used from time to time which is is having a radical transparency and and, and i think that plays to what julia was saying about um you know there will be differences and and i suppose the best safeguard 
during a very, very formative period where everything's developing, you don't want to stifle innovation. So you don't want standardization to kill off innovation. So you want things to come through, but at the same time, you want to be able to try and compare like with like. And, and the best perhaps situation is that you, we, we need to promote real transparency around what the, what the assumptions are, what the methods are that are being used. Um, and because because greenwash can be both deliberate and completely inadvertent, um, so so it's so I think that transparency approach is is really important at this stage, and uh, yeah, hopefully things will come together and standardise and, and and coalesce much more. But the the technology dimension is really important that you talk about, um, but obviously there's no um, as bit as people you know will know the phrase there's, there doesn't seem to be any single silver bullet. In, in any of this, you know, that you're going to have a very complicated landscape for some time. And Dan, just to kind of conclude on that, you might be on mute as well, actually. Um, in a way, I think it's a case of responding as a standards body with both um, a suite of different solutions. Partly it's things like maybe pass fail test criteria on technology, but having to, to what you talked about really, sort of high level principles and terminology, which allows for some degree of consistency and sort of comparability. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it is really important for standards bodies to be very careful about the way they go to um, emerging technologies and innovation, because standards do have a role in creating market confidence and giving people the assurance that what, um, the, that what the, the innovation is creating is working and reliable, um, but you can't go too hard too quickly as the other panelists have said really and you know sort of a lot of early stage standardization does need to be about creating common language for people to exchange information in making it clear what information needs to be exchanged so that people can make their own judgments it needs to be about understanding how to measure and characterize things it's it's those types of things that will that come first before you get too prescriptive about you know, actually, yes, this is what a product or service should do. You know, there's a, there's a stage before that about just establishing the, um, I suppose, the ecosystem in which people can communicate about what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think, I think just in closing, really, um, I think that this is all about conversations. It's all about collaboration, communication, and consensus, agreeing what does good look like. I think inevitably whether it's to do with product labeling and Julie you mentioned about the work we, we're doing there is, is relatively well advanced obviously on in terms of the, uh, the, the voluntary carbon markets again some some great work done at some pace there with what Helen was talking about really just the beginning of sort of you know trying to scope out what's needed but either way there are solutions starting to kind of emerge in all these areas which is really why we brought you all together so i think in conclusion you know more work to do clearly but equally we should celebrate the work we have done already in bringing some clarity so can i think thank the three of you can i thank helen as well and can i say uh, thank you to all those who uh, uh, logged on to attend and also uh, thank the bsi events team as well who've been driving this show in the back as well so hopefully you found this very useful there are more um, net zero events taking place all this week as well and we'll be recording all of them so sign up for as many as you can do and then listen at your leisure if needs be but thank you for joining us today and uh, hopefully we'll see you net zero week next year thanks very much bye and thank you all bye bye